Hey everyone! Today, I'm going to be talking about macros in TypeScript and JavaScript. Now, macros aren't a part of JavaScript or TypeScript natively, but using some libraries, bundlers, runtimes, and even TypeScript itself, we can actually make macros that solve some stuff for us at compile time instead of runtime. First off, we kind of need to understand what macros actually are. They're a type of code inlining. The code inlining that we're most familiar with are functions, right? So we can have a function, abstract some logic, pull it out somewhere else, especially if we're going to be reusing that logic. And it makes our outer function that's calling this function actually easier to read as well. One thing to remember, though, is that functions happen at runtime, which means that there's going to be some overhead to calling it when it calls it from the heap. Instead, compile time macros allow us to basically copy and paste the inner logic of our macro into the place that's calling it without us having to like do that ourselves and without the overhead of calling it at runtime because it's actually been inlined at compile time. That's very useful. In Rust, it's also especially useful because there is no function overloading in Rust, which means that when you call a function in Rust, you have to have explicitly defined arguments that the bar checker can actually make sure everything is what it says it is, which means that if we were going to do a log statement, it could get a little hairy. In JavaScript, we have log statements that allow any type, whatever, and it'll just log it out as a string for us, no problem. In Rust, they don't have that, right? Instead, you'd have to have a log int function or a log string function or a log double or a log whatever function. You'd have to really like make a bunch of this stuff and it would be really annoying to do and to have to memorize all these functions for calling it. Instead, you can have a macro that defines the semantics of whatever types you pass to it. And at compile time, it will actually inline all the logic for jamming it all together and coercing the types and printing these things as we expect them to. There's also C++ macros, and there's a little bit of a foot gun with C++ macros. Rust macros have actually solved this problem for us, but C++ still has this issue because of legacy support and things like that. And I'd like to dig into this issue a little bit because I think it's interesting. The tricky thing about macros in C++ is that they use textual replacement. And I'll give you an example of why that can be an issue, and it can lead to some very tricky bugs or at least unexpected bugs. So if we take a macro, let's call it square, and all it's going to do is multiply an, a number or an expression that we pass to it by itself and give us the result back. So if we did square of 5, we would get 5 times 5, which results in 25. Now, what if we were to pass 2 plus 3 instead of 5? It evaluates to 5, doesn't it? But remember, it's a textual replacement. So instead, it's going to pass 2 plus 3 into it where x goes. So it's going to be 2 plus 3 times 2 plus 3. That is not going to be 25. That's going to be 11 due to order of operations. So if we're not careful about wrapping the arguments that we pass into our macros, we could actually get very different results than we're expecting. But wait, why are we talking about Rust and C++? This is a JavaScript TypeScript video. So let's talk about some libraries you could use with JavaScript TypeScript to get macros into your code base. So one would be Suite.js, which is a bit older. It's maybe six or seven years since it's had a significant update, and that might be okay. It might especially be okay if you need to use it in a legacy code base, such as Gulp or Grunt-based, and maybe before Babel existed. If you do have Babel, a more modern and up-to-date and maintained tool is Babel Plugin Macros by Kent C. Dodds. I also saw some other heavy hitters in there, such as Sunil Pai from PartyKit. So there's a lot of really good developers that have made Babel Plugin Macros robust, tested, and documented, and usable in the way that we want to use it. If you ever used twin.macro, which is a way of using Tailwind inside of styled components, you actually used Babel Plugin Macros under the hood already. Another cool implementation of macros for JavaScript TypeScript comes from Bun. I think in version 0.6.0, they added this feature for macros, and they use a very cool new syntax called import attribute syntax. Now, keep in mind that import attribute syntax is stage 3, and stage 3 means that it's not fully ratified as a specification yet. It's still a proposal. But remember that stage 3 is still like 
it's gone through enough review, it's gone through enough criticism that it's ready for people to start using it. So people have criticized Bun for using import attribute syntax a little early. Some people have said that it's a manipulation of what it was intended for. But I think actually Bun is proving out a use case for it that maybe wasn't intended, but could totally be useful. And that's why it's still a proposal. They're looking for new use cases that they might have missed. So it's very cool. But one thing to remember is when you implement a spec too soon, you could run into issues. This actually happened with the TypeScript team when they did some decorator stuff too soon. They used decorators when I believe it was only at stage two, and then it turns out that people went back to the drawing board and re-implemented some of the specifications of how decorators work. So now, basically, anything below TypeScript 5.0 is using the old version of decorators, and it's a breaking change to upgrade to the new version of decorators. For the most part, like it looks the same to us as consumers, but the internals under the hood are what changed, and that's why it was a breaking change for TypeScript. They actually vowed to never implement something too soon again because of the amount of churn that it caused. Now, I don't think that's a problem for Bun because again, this is stage three and that's the perfect moment to try these things out to actually show the new use cases. And I think the criticisms are actually unfounded. You might be thinking I brought up decorators for no reason whatsoever than talking about the spec proposal process and the dangers of opting in too early to a spec, when instead, it's actually at the core of this technique I'm gonna show you using just raw TypeScript. Now, I didn't come up with this technique. This technique actually comes from TSOA, which is TypeScript Open API, and it's a way of generating an open API spec from your TypeScript code, which is really cool. And it's actually the same thing I'm doing with my code too. I took major inspiration from it, especially because it is a zero runtime decorator. It's a no-op. It just returns straight from the function that is your decorator. Why is that important? Because who wants to incur extra runtime overhead for something that is only meant for build time stuff? All it does is take in a typed set of arguments that will actually break your build if you're passing the wrong arguments, etc. which means we get full type safety of this route decorator. That is more useful than maybe doc blocks that you know, require extra editor tooling and things like that to actually make sure are parsed properly. You can break your whole build if someone is doing the route decorator wrong. Now, I am also using this route decorator that I have for generating my open API spec, but I wanted to do it in a slightly different way. I wanted to add some extra metadata myself, and it didn't make sense to fork their entire library just for this one little bit because I had different things I wanted to do, and the structure of my project is very different from like their expected project structure. But I still think it's a really cool technique, and I wanted to make sure I shouted out TSOA. But let's look at some of the implementation details of how my decorator works. So first, when we look at it, we see there's the summary, the description, the path, and the tags. These are all very important for creating a readable open API spec so that people understand what this route's for, how it's doing it. We also see the method for calling this route, and we can see what headers might be passed to it. Right now I'm using a variable for common headers. We'll dig into why that's a little tricky here in a second. We can also see that I'm sending the request and the response schema, and even the error schema if we're gonna have one of those. So, you know, there's a lot that we can pass to this that then goes, gets combed and generated and jammed together into an open API file so that we can have a nice clean documentation file for developers internally at my company or developers uh, external making plugins to use is very cool and useful. Uh, another thing you might see is public here. That's actually because I have two separate APIs. One is a public API and one is a private API. The private API would be for me as a dev in my applications and various things. And the public API would be possibly for consumers of SDKs or uh, maybe even plugin developers. We also see here that Request schema and response schema, those are just strings. They relate to some types that I have in another file that gets combed by another script I have to actually turn those into JSON files that make sense for OpenAPI to list out, you know, what the payloads are and what the responses are. Another interesting thing that I was mentioning is that common headers value there. It's just a variable. And at the time that we're combing this decorator, we don't know what that variable evaluates to. In the same way, when we see defined errors, we see that I'm just using 400, 401, 404. Well, what if I wanted to use an enum for like, you know, uh, error.client error, error.unauthorized, error.notfound. 
Those would also need to be evaluated in a special way when combing things because, again, what it evaluates to is unknown to the AST parser when we're doing things. So there's a little bit of extra work. For the defined errors, it just made sense to put the strings in. For the common headers, that's just an extra thing I ended up doing. But if I wanted to add extra headers that were acceptable here, I'd probably just do them as raw strings because we'd have that available at AST time. The decorator I just showed you is only part of it though. So once I have this decorator, I actually need to parse it and run it through some scripting. And let's take a look at what that script is actually doing. Cause this is where kind of like the main logic and meat of my, my code actually happens. So let's take a look. Uh, first, I have to comb through all of the index files in this project. This project is using Architect for Lambda-based APIs. It's just nice to have it scale to zero if no one's using it. So for someone bootstrapping, I think AWS Lambda is a great idea, but I digress. Um, for each file that I do find, I need to look for a class. And in that class, I would have a decorator on that class. Decorators just tend to work best on classes for now, at least. Uh, once I've found the decorators, I make sure that the name is route because I might be using other decorators somewhere. Uh, I also want to grab the arguments. And once I get those arguments, I need to parse them into a string, basically, because I need to do a bunch of magic. And this is where that variable for common headers kind of kicks in. So I need to actually define common headers by importing it into this script and then injecting it into this, uh, this string that I'm going to be jamming together before the resulting stringified options that I have. Now, the reason that is is because I'm about to eval this thing. I know eval, not a great idea, but it does allow me to kind of like process some of these variables that would have just been strings that would have been undefined because they're not in that context. So now I can evaluate them, turn them into a string, eval that into an object that I can then return out to the rest of my script. Once I've gotten out to the rest of my script, it's pretty much just a bunch of taking the variables from that route options object and jamming them together into my open API spec. So a lot of this is just string concatenation and uh, formatting strings and things like that. So the logic isn't really that complicated. The, the part I really wanted to show you was combing over the AST using the class declarations and then looking for the decorators and then doing my magic. Now, I know I jumped around a bit I might have missed some things. If you have some questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. I'd also love to see some comments about what you might do with macros using either Babel plugin macros, Sweet.js, or possibly even Bun. I'd love to hear some use cases for ideas I haven't even thought about before. Check out the blog post by Bun, which will be linked below. And um, also, I'll be coming out with a video about ASTs. ASTs are actually how I do the crawling of the entire code base to grab that route decorator. So I'll have a video about ASTs coming out soon. If you want to get notified when that comes out, maybe leave a subscribe, and I will talk to you guys later. Cheers.